All right, good morning, everyone. Um, as you probably know by now, I'm John Sweeting, the new uh, Director of Registration Services uh, at Aaron. Um, I'm used to being up here and giving some uh, AC reports and other things, but uh, I am now Aaron's staff, so I will be given the policy experience report on policies that I probably had a little bit to do with when they became policy. Uh, so we'll jump right into this. Um, so the purpose of the policy experience report is to review existing policies, to look through and find out, you know, if there's language in there that could be made more clear for um, our customers to be able to go through the processes and understand the policies. Uh, it, it's really amazing to me being on that other side now of how much ambiguity and differences there are in the way words are written and how people interpret them. And, and it really helps to get the feedback from the community so we can look at that. And sometimes it's very obvious once it's pointed out, but when it's not, when we don't really, aren't looking for it, it's really hard to find. So lots of input is good. Uh, we also look at it to identify new areas. Uh, the analysts put things together, they talk and they say, hey, there's been a lot of this going on lately. Maybe we need to have a policy that addresses it, that helps us do the, the job better and more efficient, more effective. Um, and then, of course, we want to provide that feedback back to, to you guys here at the meetings. Today, I'm going to talk about two policies that were reviewed. Um, NERPM 5 is the AS number policy, and NERPM 42, well, NERPM, of course, is the um, <laughs> number, resource, <laughs> number policy. resource policy manual, which I should know. And <laughs> paragraph 5, and, the, and also within the NERPM, Paragraph 4236, which is reassignments to multi-home downstream customers. And getting right into the AS number policy, uh, when I first got there, um, the analyst, the staff in RSD came to me and said, you know, we're spending a lot of time to give out or approve AS numbers. Um, there's a, there's a, it's complicated, the customers come in, they want to do BGP, they're, they're, they're starting up a network. They want to start out configured with BGP. They, sometimes it's they don't have the, you know, the revenue to start out with two providers. So we ask them for, you know, just you know, to have the contracts. But, you know, it, it's just, a, it was, seems to be a very convoluted process to get an AS, AS number. Um, so the current policy text says, in order to be assigned an AS number, each requesting organization must provide Aaron with verification that it is either a unique routing policy um, or it's a multi-home site. I think we covered the unique routing policy in, at, in Jamaica and um, got some further clarity on that and understanding, uh, but the multi-home site portion is what I'm gonna concentrate on today. Uh, so AS numbers are, are issued based on current need as well, uh, and it states in the NERPM that it's, uh, you can only get an AS number well, it says you should only request an AS number when it's already multi-homed or will immediately become multi-homed. Immediately is kind of a, a problem. Um, usually, from what I un understand being there for the last two months, immediately almost is always interpreted as within 30 days. So, um, there you go. The current practice is to confirm connectivity with two upstream providers making sure we either want to see connectivity contracts, invoices, or address reassignments with the two providers. Um, as you can see, there's problems with that. Sometimes when the address, uh, two providers won't both give addresses because they say, well, you're getting it from your other provider, so we're not going to give you any, especially today when addresses are getting scarce. Um, and then to confirm the deployment within 30 days, the immediately portion of it. So what we're asking is, are these correct given that ASNs are no longer scarce, not considered like, you know, a limited resource? Um, so that's one of the things I'd like you to think about. Is this really the way you want us to be reviewing uh, requests for AS numbers? Some of the customer feedback that we've received is uh, that 30 days is just too short of a time frame. They want to have everything needed to deploy their multi-home site three months before turning it up. 
Um, some of the other comments, requirements to have connectivity with two upstream providers immediately is burdensome. Uh, they don't want to spend the money on that second connection until they have a, a, you know, a firm customer base that is providing the revenue that's going to pay for, for that second connection to, to a different provider. Um, but they still want to start out configuring their network with BGP. Therefore, they need the AS number. Um, so a couple of options. Some of the options uh, leave the existing policy procedures as it is. Or we could do a procedure change, uh, interpret immediate to be longer, 90 days, 180 days, um, allow verification by identifying two upstream providers and confirming multi-homing will be turned up with them. Again, it's, it's the how long do they get to wait before they turn it up. Um, possibly we do um, officer at the station for how long, you know, they're going to use this many IP addresses within 24 months. Do we get that and say, hey, we're going to be multi-homed within six months, 12 months, 24 months, whatever makes sense there. That would be more into the uh, policy change itself, um, which there, that's the next item there. Insert specific time frame verification requirements. Um, and that's it on that that's all I have for the the AS number but we really want to you know once I finish with the next one we re I really would like to uh, to hear your feedback on on what you think we should be doing or what's the best way to, to tackle that I, I can tell you it is it is a very time-consuming process for for uh, getting an AS number today and there's a lot of AS numbers that come in Okay, so now on to uh, the reassignments to the multi-home downstream customers. The policy text reads, this policy allows a downstream customer's multi-homing requirement to serve as justification for a slash 24 reassignment from their upstream ISP, regardless of host requirement. So what that allows is when we allocate to an ISP, they can then assign or allocate a slash 24 to one of their customers based strictly on the fact they're multi-homed. There's no host requirement there. Um, the problem is that Aaron itself, we can't do that. We can't do what we allow the ISPs to do. We don't have, there's nothing in the NERPM that says Aaron can issue a slash 24 regardless of host count just based on the, the uh, customer being multi-home. So um, the problem is networks may be unable to obtain a slash 24 to multi-home po post depletion. Going back to the scarcity of resources, some upstreams don't want to give addresses anymore. They they tell them, oh, we're not, you know, we're we're not giving them to you. We just don't have them. It, it, yeah, it might be they don't want to. They want to give them, but they just don't have them. So there's no policy to allow that network to obtain a slash 24 on the transfer market since 4236 applies only to ISPs and not to Aaron. So it's really, they're, they're not going to come back and get a 24 from the free pool because there are none. They could go on the waiting list with it if we, if we change that, but basically what, it, what we're looking at is a way they could, their multi-home, their upstream wants to take back their IPs, that they could go and get a 24 on the transfer market under, the, under our rules. Uh, so the frustrations we've heard is, I don't understand why an ISP can assign me a 24, but Aaron can't. I can't use anything smaller than a 24. You guys don't seem to understand that. And how am I supposed to multi-home if I cannot obtain a, 20, a slash 24? So again, to the options on this one, um, some of the options we've thought of, there's, there's probably more. So if you, can, if you have a better one, please share it. Uh, we can leave it as is. We can change, uh, NERPM could be, section four could be changed to allow multi-homing to uh, be a good justification for a slash 24. Um, and again, it would apply to the waiting list and transfer requests. And, um, or we could change NERPM section eight transfers to allow multi-homing um, as justification. And that would only apply to transfer requests. So the difference there is if it's in section four, it would apply to both the waiting list and transfer requests. If it's in section eight, it would um, apply only to transfer requests and not to the waiting list. That's it. So. Okay. Um, 
That one? Lovely. Okay. So um, we got a presentation. First thing is, does anyone have any questions for John regarding his presentation? Any clarifications, additional information, confusion over what he presented? Yes, Kevin. Kevin Bloomberg, The Wire, NRONC. Step uh, closer to the microphone. John, very quickly. Um, it might be very beneficial to include, uh, like you did in uh, the first one, to put in what a unique routing policy is, uh, because I think many people today will actually just use, oh, I'm a unique routing policy, and not even touch the multi-homing. So while I agree that cleanup is probably needed, um, I don't think most people outside of this room will know what a unique routing policy is in regards to how Aaron defines it. So I don't know if that's anywhere. It's sort of a um, amorphous. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, in regards to the slash 24 requirements, um, absolutely agree it needs to be simplified and, and brought in line. But the other problem with that is that we also have the reserved pools. And um, it's important to take into account how this will apply to reserved pools as well, because we have had policy previously that would have done that partially for 4.10, and, and it failed with the community previously. So want people to come up. Any clarifications or questions on John's presentation? We need to be careful not to go into advocacy of a particular policy change, because we could be here all day, and this isn't a policy block. So go ahead. Questions to John about his presentation? Can I just uh, Kevin, uh, the unique routing policy was covered in depth in Jamaica. Um, it was a, it was a, on the policy experience report there. Um, I'm not really, I'm not prepared to like go any deeper into it right this second. It's not on the website for the average per, uh, person to see. That's the point I'm trying to make. Oh, okay, thank you. We'll take care of that. Okay. Next, John. John Springer, uh, Aaron E.C. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to be presenting a recommended draft policy this afternoon that hopefully will take care of uh, your second bullet point here. Uh, that's policy proposal 2016-4. Uh, you can find it in your, uh, your guides. Excellent. Back microphone. Hi, uh, Chris Woodfield with Twitter. Uh, regarding the AS allocation, um, given that we're now in a 32-bit address space, it seems to me that an allocation of an AS number is, is sorry, the AS number pool is no scarcer than, say, the IPv6 address pool. Have there ever been, have there been any proposals to tie the allocation of an AS number to the allocation of an IPv4 or v6 prefix? I haven't seen a proposal to that effect in this region. I believe in another, is there a region out there where the uh, V6 and AS allocations are given the same time? I know it was discussed in one region. No, I guess not. Um, so right now, I don't know of anything where you get them both at once. Well, not necessarily get them both at once, but maybe the fact that you have an, air, an allocation can be used as justification for obtaining a AS number. Certainly a possibility. Owen DeLong, Aaron AC, uh, Akamai. Um, regards the unique routing policy, it was covered pretty well in Jamaica. It should be on the website. Uh, it is a bit amorphous, and in my experience, that's a pretty good thing because there are actually a lot of things you can do that qualify as a unique routing policy. And I've had many a customer in my consulting business in the past that has taken full advantage of that fact in order to be able to get ASNs for uh, creative and interesting purposes that are perfectly legitimate and would otherwise be very difficult to deal with. And I've had a few customers, for example, where that's not permitted in APNIC, they strictly require multi-homing or did up until a recent policy change and um, it's been problematic. So I, I'm strongly in favor of keeping that provision and uh, explaining it a little better, but not locking it down too tightly would probably be a good thing. Okay, back microphone. Rob Seastrom, uh, Aaron AC, Charter Communications. Um, <clears throat> I got ASNs back in the dawn of time, and the bar for demonstrating need was extraordinarily low because there was no scarcity. 
in the absence of a scarcity regime, I am in favor of making the bar similarly low. Mm -hmm. I think that you needed to be able to spell EGP at the time in order to qualify for an ASN. I'm not in favor of just handing them out with prefixes, um, despite the fact that 32 bits for ASNs looks pretty low. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for John? Okay, thank you, John.